Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It is my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Russ Poldrack, the Albert Ray Lang Professor of Psychology and Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. Dr. Poldrack completed his bachelor's degree in psychology from Baylor University in 1989 and his PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1995, working closely with Neil J. Cullen. From 1995 to 1999, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, working closely with John Gabrielli. In his professional experience, uh, pr prior to his appointment at Stanford in 2014, he held faculty positions at Harvard Medical School, at UCLA, and at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he has been the PI on numerous NIH-funded and NSF-funded grants in brain research, the modeling of cognitive ontologies, as well as the fields of neuroinformatics and data science. He's uh, been uh, awarded a Distinguished Scientific um, Award uh, in Early Career Contributions to Psychology from the American Psychological Association. He was awarded the Wiley Young Investigator Award from the Organization of for Human Brain Mapping in 2005, and is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Sciences elected in 2009. He's also served as the chairperson of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. He is the founder and co-editor of the uh, uh, Frontiers in Brain Imaging Methods, and he was the chair of the external advisory panel for the Human Connectome Project and a member of advisory panels for the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study as well as the, the Kavli Human Study. The work from his laboratory involves functional neuroimaging, the study of learning and memory, executive function decision-making, uh, the uh, uh, notions of reverse inference, um, as well as um, the pursuits in neuroinformatics, data science, data sharing, and reproducible and responsible science. His lecture today is entitled Towards a Culture of Computational Reproducibility. And as always, we are streaming this lecture live uh, and for recording via YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Poldrack by the chat feature in your Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Poldrack's lecture. And with that, welcome, Russ. Thank you so much. We are really looking forward to your lecture. All right, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Happy to be here and hello to everybody on YouTube. Um, so I wanna to talk today about kind of moving towards a culture of reproducibility. And when I talk about reproducibility, I'm primarily focusing on what people often refer to as computational reproducibility. Um, you know, this is Ping's uh, kind of spectrum of reproducibility. On, on the one hand, you have kind of, you know, like full replication, like a new study, new data. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of just before that, the idea of, you know, kind of sharing everything that goes into an analysis and simply being able to reproduce the results that one finds. Now, now obviously, you know, in the end, we want to be able to generalize out to new data and, and new, you know, new analysis code as well. And I'll talk some about that. But I, the, the point here I want to make here is I'm really focusing on reproducibility as sort of um, not quite all the way to replication, but simply taking a, a, a completed study and, you know, showing that we can reproduce the results. Now, um, you know, a lot of my thinking is inspired by this quote from David Donahoe, a statistician here at Stanford, who was really one of the pioneers of kind of reproducible data science, who said an article about a computational result is advertising, not scholarship. The actual scholarship is the full software environment code and data that produce the result. Um, so why is this a problem? Well, you know, first, in many different domains, data analysis today is highly complex and offers an extreme degree of flexibility in the way that one can do one's analyses. And it's generally impossible to reproduce a result just using the publication. And even with the code and the data, it can be different, difficult to reproduce the result. So I wanna sort of talk through an example of this um, from a study that I did a few years ago. This was a study where I had scanned myself repeatedly over the course of a year and a half, collected you know, blood data, did RNA sequencing. Um, and then we published a paper where we tried to build a reproducible analysis workflow. 
Um, and we did this using a technology called virtual machines, which is basically building sort of a, a, a little computer inside a computer that should look exactly the same way for anybody who runs it. And so we gave this out and basically said, hey, if you run this thing, uh, you install it in your computer and run it, you know, it'll take a few hours. Um, and ultimately, you'll have all the same results that we used in the that we re report in the paper. So I get an email maybe a year later. Hi, I'm an undergraduate student at Johns Hopkins. I'm trying to, you know, reproduce your results. I'm, I've run into some trouble reproducing the RNA seq results. There's supposed to be 63 co-expression modules, but when I run the scripts, I only get 60. I reran the analysis with the VM, and the real result is 60. Um, essentially, the same code is run on the same data, but arrives at two different results. What might be going on? Um, and it turns out that if you look at the version of the R package that we used to do that analysis in the paper, it was 1.47. Um, by the time you know he went to run the analysis, it was version 1.51. And it turns out that our virtual machine pulled the latest version of the code, and that little change from 1.747 to 1.51 resulted in differences in the results of the analysis. Even though we had this like fully reproducible, in theory, uh, analysis platform. We also know that, you know, small differences can actually have impact on analysis results. This is some work from Tristan Gotthard a few years ago showing that um, if you run FreeSurfer on, uh, on structural imaging data, you can get different results either between different Linux versions or even between different software builds, which they ultimately track down to particular numeric libraries. Um, so that's that's one sort of set of concerns around uh, you know the platform dependence and the version dependence of results. Another has to do with software errors. So. Um, you know, much of what we do as scientists is really amateur software engineering right and the question is how likely are we to make errors if you look at professional software developers on their first submission of code they across studies make anywhere from one to 50 errors per thousand of lines of code um, so how many errors do we think we make as amateur software developers um, and how likely are they to impact our scientific conclusions well we know of examples where this has happened um, one comes from the work of Jeffrey Chang. He was a structural biologist who published a bunch of papers in the early 2000s about this particular protein, the ABC transporter, and um, ended up having to retract five papers because um, there was a piece of code that they used they'd actually gotten from someone else um, that ended up causing a sign flip that caused the wrong uh, handedness of the protein structures. Um, and a particular concern is, you know, what some of us have started calling bug hacking, which is the idea that um, when, you know, bugs aren't neutral in terms of, you know, our likelihood of finding them, right? If we have a bug that disconfirms our predictions, it gives us results that we quote unquote don't like, we're much more likely to dig in and sort of find that bug than if we have a bug that gives us the results that we're expecting or sort of gives us results that are better than they actually uh, should be. Um, so I'm going to argue that we need to develop a culture of computational reproducibility, that everything that we do needs to be sort of focused on how we can do science that's computationally reproducible. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to lay this out in terms of um, an idea that, that was inspired by reading uh, Kent Beck's work on extreme programming, where he talks about a culture of, of you know, software development. Um, and so the which it sort of frames it around the idea of values, principles, and practices. So what, and um, this, this idea of culture is also, you know, sort of highlighted in the, the work from the National Academies a couple of years ago, where they said, recommendation number one, research institutes should work to create a culture that actively supports open science by design and reproducibility is part of that. So what are these values that I talk about? Well, the first should be objectivity, right? Which basically means we want to get the answers right. And one objectivity is a complex concept in the philosophy of science. And one, one way that I like that people talk about it is in terms of minimizing what you might think of as epistemic risk, the risk of having like incorrect knowledge. Um, another value is community. You know, we think that science should be a communal rather than a competitive endeavor. Third is respect, that the community should be open and inclusive and respect the contributions and positionality of each individual. 
Fourth is humility. We have to acknowledge the fact that we're humans and everything we do has biases and limitations. And then there's also constraints on the generality of our work. Fifth value is openness. Our work should be available to others to reproduce and use. And um, six is transparency. Our work should be clear and understandable to others. So then the question is, how do we turn those values into principles? Um, now, you might be asking, why is he talking about like, you know, openness and inclusivity here? And, you know, there are clearly humanistic reasons that, you know, that we want to be open and inclusive and diverse. Um, but there's also good reasons from the philosophy of science. And this is um, a quote from Helen Longino, who's a, a feminist philosopher of science who um, has laid out this argument that, you know, why does, why does science work, right? Um, and she, one of her arguments is that science works exactly because it's a social phenomenon that takes ideas and puts them up to scrutiny. And so this is a quote from her. When background assumptions are shared by all members of a community, they acquire an invisibility that renders them unavailable for criticism. They don't become visible until individuals who don't share the community's assumptions can provide alternative explanations of phenomena without those assumptions. As for example, Einstein could provide an alternative explanation of the Michelson-Morley interferometer experiment because he didn't share the assumption of the variable speed of light. From all this, again, it follows that the greater the number of different points of view included in a given community, the more likely it is that its scientific practice will be objective and result in descriptions and explanations of natural processes that are more reliable than would otherwise be the case. Okay, so what are the principles that we're going to use to kind of you know guide the practices? Well, one is going to be diversity. We want a com community to be as diverse, inclusive, and equitable as possible. Um, we're going to build around community standards. We need we want our work to be structured by a common understanding of what best practices are. We want to sort of highlight the role of reflection on our on our own practices. So following Feynman's uh, quote that the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And I'm going to focus on the idea of uh, errors as sort of the best learning experiences. Um, a fourth principle is continuous improvement. The idea that, you know, that Everything we do, but particularly software development, is a skill that we have to continuously and deliberately hone. And fifth is a principle of portability, the idea that um, any analysis should be repeatable at different times across different systems. So you can think of reproducibility at some, at some way as like you know, portability in time. So finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through a set of practices, and this is gonna be the meat of the talk. Um, I'm gonna first talk about how building and nurturing a community. Second, about how coding for reproducibility. Third, about sharing and openness. And fourth, about automation. So first, building a community. Um, so, you know, everybody talks about how they want to collaborate, but um, there's more to collaboration than simply, you know, sort of exchanging knowledge and having a, a common goal across teams. And this is an illustration from the Turing Way, which is a really nice um, uh, project from the Alan Turing Institute that lays out a, a bunch of you know, thoughts about how to build open, inclusive, diverse, collaborative teams. I, I definitely would, would uh, recommend having a look at that resource. Um, so the, one of the, the important aspects of building a, an open community is um, making it clear how people can become a part of the community and contribute. Um, and, and one of the things one can do there is uh, giving out guidelines to, so this is an example of, um, for our fMRI prep project, which is a, a, a data pre-processing workflow for, for fMRI data. Um, we lay out uh, basically, you know, one, why, you know, how can somebody contribute? Why should they contribute? And then give a lot of details about the specific ways in which, you know, a person can go about contributing. Um, and, you know, really trying to make the project as, as open and inviting as possible to anybody with any set of skills, you know, making it clear you don't have to be like a, you know, a super expert coder to contribute. Second is codes of conduct, making it clear that, you know, we want to build a community that's opening, open and welcoming to everybody um, and that's harassment free. And so this is our fMRI prep code of conduct. There's a lot of, you know, various codes of conduct that are available out there to kind of, uh, to crib from, and that's what we did here. But just basically making it clear, what do you, what are you expected to, how are you expected to behave as part of this community? Now, you know, a lot of these practices have been put in place in um, hackathons, and you know, hackathons are common in lots of different areas. Um, you know, I have experience with the ones in neuroscience, in particular, um, 
the brain hack, which has been you know held around the um, the OHBM meeting for the last few years. Um, Cameron Craddock is you know has been one of the the main organizers along with Pierre Bellek and others, and has written a paper recently about this idea. Um, and really, you know, what they do is they try to bring people in through educational experiences and get them involved in community through, you know, working together on hacking projects. And this is Kirsty Whitaker having a lot of fun at uh, the, the brain hack a couple of years ago. Um, so, so I think that, you know, the, the brain imaging community is, uh, has given us like a really nice example of like how this sort of like open science community that's kind of you know diverse and open and welcoming can actually work um, and so i definitely would would uh, invite all of you to take part actually brain hack global is happening right now so um so i don't know I, you can probably still sort of get involved in it um but certainly in the future you know becoming involved in, in hackathons is a great way to sort of start working to build this community all right so now let's talk about how to code for reproducibility um, and um, there's a number of features that are important for writing high quality code, right? One is that it needs to be readable. Um, and I'll talk more about this. Second is it needs to be robust. It needs to you know, run across different platforms and get the same answer. It needs to be modular, uh, both for reusability and also for easier testability. And finally, it needs to be well-tested. Um, and I wanna highlight the fact that you know, coding is a craft, right? Many people have hobbies, you know, I play guitar and the only way you get better at playing guitar is by practicing. Um, similarly, the only way you get better at coding is by consistent and deliberate practice. And this is highlighted in the fact that, you know, the software carpentry sort of uses this analogy directly, right? That uh, we, you need, to, uh, you need to, to practice the skills just as you would if you're gonna become a carpenter. Um, so it turns out that there's, you know, a good bit that's known from software engineering about, you know, how to build better software. So, you know, what, what's striking is, you know, even in commercial software development, about 40 to 50%, and this is written a few years ago, I don't know if these numbers have changed a lot, they probably have with the advent of, of better software engineering practices, um, about 40 per, to 50% of the effort is spent on avoidable rework. This is professional software developers. During development, almost no modules are defect-free as they've been implemented. And post-release, this is after they've been reviewed, about 40% of modules may be defect-free. That meaning the majority of them still had defects. Peer reviews can catch about 60% of the defects and discipline, disciplined personal practices can reduce defect rates by up to 75%. So what are some of those practices? Well, the first that, you know, that I think everybody should be using, and most of you are probably familiar with, is version control. If you have programmed without using version control, you're probably accustomed to seeing file names like this, uh, where you basically have embedded the version control in the file name. Um, version control, you know, using tools like Git and GitHub provides a, a much better way to, um, to track what's been done with code. It also provides a really nice and, and easy way to experiment uh, using branches. Um, and so if you're not uh, familiar with Git, I would suggest maybe starting with the, um, the software carpentry uh, modules on, on Git and GitHub, which are really nice. Um, another thing that I think gets less, you know, many people are familiar with version control. I think many few people are, many fewer people are familiar with coding style. Um, and coding style is really important because, you know, as the founder of Python, Guido van Rossum said, code is read much more often than it's written. So readability counts. Um, now, nearly every language has a language specific convention for coding style. Um, and following those conventions makes your code easier for others to read and understand. And it's important to keep in mind that others includes your future self, right? When you look back at code six months from now, it's as if you are a different person. And so if the code is readable, you'll be, you'll be much more easily able to figure out what on earth was I trying to do there? Now, there's also a lot of sort of language independent principles of software design. I'm showing a few of the books here that, that I found useful. Um, I think as a starting point, um, this book called The Art of Readable Code um, 
is probably a, a great starting point for just learning sort of language independent principles of how to, how to write good code. It may focus a lot on kind of making it understandable. Now, you know, we mentioned the idea that uh, code review can find lots of bugs. Um, and um, this sort of fits with Linus's law from Linus Torvald, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, right? If enough people look at code, um, the bugs are gonna pop out to somebody. Um, and so the, the idea of code review for scientific code has been around for a long time. Uh, Petrie and Wilson wrote about this, you know, a number of years ago. Um, but I think there's increasing interest recently, you know, there's just a Twitter thread a couple days ago about this with a number of people chiming in about how they've started implementing this, you know, in their labs. Um, but this paper lays out kind of some nice ideas about how to implement this. We've started implementing code review regularly in our lab meetings. Roughly once a month, we take somebody's code and sort of walk through it and do a review. Um, so another, you know, important thing that I think gets less uh, notice in scientific code is uh, testing. So any function that does something important should be tested. Um, one, it should make sure that, you know, you know what the code should do and you want to write tests that make sure it does the things properly. You also want to make sure that like in the, in the, the occasions when the code should like, you know, raise an error that it actually does that, right? That it doesn't sort of just give you, you know, garbage out for garbage in. Now, most languages have powerful testing frameworks. You know, I'm familiar with the ones in Python and R. Um, Martin Fowler, who's, you know, the, one of the kind of, you know, deans of software engineering says, whenever you're tempted to type something into a print statement or a debugger expression, write it as a test instead. And we, we often in my lab try to use something, there's an idea called test-driven development and we don't do this kind of, you know, kind of rigorously, but the idea is like, if you want to know if something's working rather than kind of, you know, just like trying it out on your, on your own, typing it into your, uh, to your uh, console, just build a test. Every time you want to check that something is working, build a new test for it, use the test framework, and then you'll have those tests around as you add new features to make sure that you haven't broken anything. Now, a corollary to this is that whenever there are well-established libraries to do something, you should use them. Um, you know, engineers often get sort of sucked in by this thing that people refer to as the NIH, the not invented here effect, in which they, they think that they need to build a new solution that's homegrown rather than use an existing solution. And my favorite example of this is the, the, the large number of DICOM to nifty converters that exist in the neuroimaging field. Um, so, you know, whenever there's an existing package, it's much better to use that package. And if you need to add features, contribute fixes or extensions to that existing package, you know, become part of that development community rather than trying to roll your own. Um, and you also want to prefer libraries that use good software engineering practices that have, you know, and this is sort of seen, for example, in scikit-learn through all the, you know, the badges, like the fact that it has 96% code coverage, 96% of the code is being tested. It's passing uh, various versions of Python, for example. Um, so, Testing is a deep rabbit hole, but there's some pretty simple things one can do. The simplest is assertions, basically just making sure that if some, if you know something to be true, make sure it's true. Um, here's an example of a case where that could have saved somebody a, a good bit of pain. This was a paper that was published in PLOS One. They shared their data because you have to with PLOS One and somebody uh, realized after looking at the data, hey, there's a, uh, this was supposed to be data from adults. There's two subjects, one with age five, one with age three, two, seven, five, seven. And um, that, when you fix those, that changes the results. Um, had they simply, you know, put in an assertion saying, hey, we need to assert that the age is between say, you know, six and 120, that would have caught uh, that issue. Now we also want to make sure that our code is actually giving us the right answer. Um, and you know, for, so to validate code, a couple things to think about are one, what we call parameter recovery, which is basically before you ever analyze real data, analyze, you know, generate some synthetic data um, where you know what the answer should be and make sure that your code can recover the known answer. Um, like I said, best to do that before you ever touch the real data. The other is null or randomization testing where you generate data where you know that there's no effect either by you know, synthetic data or by randomizing real data and make sure that your, that your analysis says, hey, there's no effect. Here's a place where that might've been useful. So this was a paper published a few years ago claiming to 
have you know very high accuracy in a very small sample of decoding you know different uh, classes of uh, of cognitive impairment using diffusion imaging. So they turns out that they what they did um, they did a feature selection step prior to cross validation which um, we know to be problematic. It's sort of basically kind of a double dipping. You're using the data to pick the best features and then using those features to actually do your cross-validation. Um, this is a simulation that I ran showing basically what happens, you know, what is the accuracy when you do feature selection within the cross-validation, which comes out here, you know, right around 0.5 on average. When you do the feature selection and then do cross-validation, you get accuracy so often perfect or, you know, around 0.9. Um, so basically just, you know, had they done some simple simulations to look at the effect of their, um, of their procedures, they would have seen, hey, this is uh, really problematic. Um, so, you know, despite all of our best efforts, we're gonna make errors in our code. And so what matters is how we respond to them when we discover them. So we had a, an issue recently where we had, um, we'd done a large analysis of the um, ABCD data set, the behavior on the data set, identified some issues with the stop signal data, um, made our code available with the, um, with the preprint. And the ABCD team dug into this and realized we had made an error um, in the code in this like really complex Boolean operation. Um, and when we fixed it, it changed the numbers. It didn't change the overall kind of take away the paper, but it definitely changed the numbers in the paper. Um, so what we did was, um, you know, we, obviously we fixed the, the preprint um, and the, the code, but we also tried to use this error as a teachable moment, taking as a model this idea um, of the morbidity and mortality conference, which is something that's done regularly at um, academic medical centers, where um, basically the idea is not to criticize, but to profit from sharing and examining experience in a blame-free environment, focusing on either like poor or intended outcomes that might've been due to, due to or worsened by error or system problems, or talking about near misses where something bad almost happened. And importantly, there's no finger pointing, right? It's really figuring out how do you, how might you fix the causes rather than kind of focusing on the errors that people made. And in particular, focusing on sort of the root causes, right? So when we've done this thinking, th you know, thinking about where errors have come from, sometimes, you know, that can include programming error, programmer error, right? They incor incorrectly index that data frame. Um, it could be a dependency, right? There's a bug in a package that I was relying on and as, as in the, um, the Steve Chang case. Um, it could also be a systemic cause. So for example, you know, we were in a hurry because we needed to get the paper submitted before, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that helps figure out how can we in the future avoid errors. Okay, I'm gonna talk now about sharing. So, you know, most of our work is paid for by taxpayers and we owe it to them to maximize the benefits of their support. We also owe it to our research subjects, human or non-human to maximize the benefits of their participation. And we owe it to the world to maximize the benefits of the carbon that we're burning, you know, running our supercomputers. So one really important thing is, is sharing code. And you know, many people are kind of you know, bashful about sharing their code because they're not, um, they're not professional programmers. They're worried that somebody's gonna find a problem with it. The question you might wanna ask yourself is if your code is not good enough to share, then why do you think it's good enough to use, to, to publish the results that rely upon it? Um, and Nick Barn made this, this case nicely a few years ago, arguing that you know, everybody should publish their code. It's, it's, if it's good enough to, to, to use for science, it's good enough to publish. Now, many people, including us, you know, would publish code just by giving a link to a, a GitHub repository. This is from a paper we published last year. Um, there's an issue with this, right? So imagine that you know, we, I, we put that link in. If somebody goes here, you know, changes have been made to that code since the paper was published. How do they know exactly which version we used if, we, if they want to reproduce those results? And what if you know, Ian Eisenberg decides to delete the repository and those, the code goes away? So, what we now like to do is um, share data using a persistent identifier, which basically provides a link to that material that guarantees that it's not going to go away. The, you're probably familiar with DOI, digital object identifier. It's, it's actually very easy to get a DOI for code. If, you, um, if your code is on GitHub and use this thing called Zenodo, which is a data sharing repository that's run by CERN in Switzerland, um, you basically just sign up for Zenodo login using your GitHub account. 
um, and then link your GitHub repository to your to, that you want to share to uh, that Zenodo account. And then anytime you create a release on GitHub, which basically says this is a kind of a frozen release of the of the repository, um, that will automatically be turned into a release on that's shared on Zenodo um, and that has a DOI. Um, so even if GitHub were to you know, God forbid, go away, those data will still be, the, sorry, the code will still be there on Zenodo for somebody to, to, to obtain. And then finally, you can put that in your paper. So here's from our recent Nature paper, we say fully reproducible code uh, for all the analyses is available here at this DOI. So it gives you a persistent identifier that's not gonna change or go away. Now, whenever you share anything, it's important to have a license associated with it, that this basically tells people what they can do with the, the stuff that you're sharing. In general, you wanna choose the most permissive license you can, um, or the one that's used by your research community. If you work with a bunch of people who use a particular license, it's probably good to use that one. And people often think that non-commercial licensing, licensing sounds like a good idea, um, but it rarely is. Um, and importantly, because the, the meaning of non-commercial is actually not really clear. Um, and it ends up greatly limiting reuse, even by people who you might want to be able to reuse it. So you have to ask your question, if, if, if somebody actually violated the license, would you pursue legal action? If not, then, um, then you certainly don't want to put a non-commercial license because you're basically, you know, wasting your time. Now, I think we probably all agree that sharing data uh, is alongside our code is essential for reproducibility. It's really easy to share data badly. Um, if you haven't seen this cartoon, data sharing and management snafu in three acts, I would uh, suggest you go to YouTube and, and search around for that because it's a pretty humorous little uh, uh, cart uh, extra normal cartoon about basically how to share data badly. Um, so one of the important aspects of um, data sharing is organizing the data in a way that other people can easily use it. Um, and using an accepted standard in one's research community is the best way to do that. So we've been involved for the last few years in building something called the Brain Imaging Data Structure or BIDS, um, which is a, uh, a standard for organizing both the data and the metadata of a neuroimaging study. Um, and the idea is like, if you, you know, if, if you share your data in that format, then other people can easily use it. Um, and if you actually organize your data in that format, format from the beginning, um, one, remember that, you know, share it, you're also sharing your data with yourself in the future. So when you go back and look at a data set next year, you'll like, you'll be able to understand it more easily if it's in the, the standard format. And it also then takes very little extra work to share the data. If you're you know, in other domains, so for electrophysiology, there's a standard called Neurodata Without Borders. For psychological data sets, there's an emerging standard called PsychDS. So the important thing is to find the standard that works for your data and use it. Um, it's also important to version data, right? Because just as you want to know exactly what version of the code was used, you know, data change, people find errors, they add, you know, variables and so on. Um, so one thing you can do, you know, for smaller data sets, we've used Git and GitHub um, on some occasions. And one way you can version something on GitHub is basically to give the, the commit ID, which is a little hash that basically refers to a specific version of the code. Um, again, we think it's better to use a repository that actually provides uh, persistent identifiers. So for example, if you want to share fMRI data, you can upload it to Open Neuro, and um, that will give you for a specific version of the data set, which is like a snapshot, a frozen snapshot of the data, you can get a DOI pointing to that particular version. So people can know exactly what version of the data set you use for your analyses. Now, licensing shared data is a little tricky because the legal status of data uh, with regard to copyright is complicated. Most, most data, not really copyrightable, but uh, nonetheless, any shared data should always have a terms of use, which people often kind of call a license associated with it, so that other people know exactly what they're allowed to do with the data. We generally prefer the most permissive uh, agreement, which is called a public domain dedication, or a, often referred to as a CC0 um, license, which basically allows pretty much anybody to do anything they want with it. And, you know, obviously we I think we have a community agreement that if you're going to use someone's data, you're going to cite that person, you know, in, in the paper. Um, 
So another thing that we need to be able to share is the platform. I mentioned before how you know the platform can make a difference. Sharing a code and the code and data is not enough. And so we've begun to focus heavily on the idea of containerization for um, for sharing platforms. Um, and the idea behind containerization is really to sort of allow you to exactly reproduce not just the code but the entire platform that. Uh, that the, the code runs on. And so the, the technology that we and most people are kind of, you know, focusing on these days is this thing called Docker, um, which is a, a you know, a, an open, openly available package that basically al allows you to define an, a computing environment um, that basically says, you know, what libraries and software packages do I need? And I can say what specific versions of them I want. Um, and that basically defines your platform for computing. And then you can basically uh, give that definition to somebody else and they can recreate that exactly and run the code in sort of exactly as close a way as is computationally possible, modulo things like floating point weirdness. Um, containers are nice one for like, you know, sharing what you've done. They also make it really easy for other people to run your code. So I mentioned fMRI prep, which is this pre-processing pipeline that we've developed. Um, you know, if you want to run fMRI prep, which is a, you know, a big package that requires lots of dependencies, you could install all those dependencies, install the package, run the package. Um, but if you have the Docker software installed, which is available for pretty much every platform, this you can basically run fMRI prep using this single command. And what it will do is go pull this specific version, Poldrack fMRI prep 20.2.0, a specific version of our package from our, um, our repository on what's called Docker Hub um, and run that thing without you having to install anything. It'll basically grab it, run it, uh, run that specific version and, um, and you're guaranteed to have it run as reproducibly as possible. Um, now, one challenge is that you can't use Docker on most high performance computing systems because it requires root access in order to, uh, to run it. Um, but there's a, um, a, another package, another project called Singularity that allows you to run containers on high performance computing systems. Um, so for example, um, you know, we have a system at Stanford called Sherlock um, and, you know, if you have a Docker image, you can basically use Singularity to run that Docker image on, uh, on the high performance computing system. We found this to be really handy because, you know, we run, uh, you know, analyses on a number of different high performance computing systems, some at Stanford, some at Texas. And using this, we can get exactly the same results from, you know, software run on very different systems. Okay, finally, I want to mention the idea of automation. Um, and so we try to, to have our goal as being to be able to, for any particular workflow, we want to be able to rerun the entire workflow on a new machine with a single command, right? I want to be able to just put everything on a new, you know, server and say, go and have it do everything. Give me all the same results that are exactly the same as I would get anywhere else. Now, a simple tool for doing that that's surprisingly useful is the make tool in Unix, um, where you basically just set up a make file. And you know, if you have like a set of scripts that you need to run, um, you can basically just say make all and it will go do all those things. And that's for simple stuff, uh, that's what we end up using. For more complicated stuff, um, you know, there's a number of different workflow management packages, some that are specific to neuroimaging. So the NiPipe. Uh, project allows you to basically, you know, mix and match uh, modules from a number of different software packages um, into a single workflow. That's actually the basis for our fMRI prep package. Um, there's also some more general uh, workflow management tools focused on machine learning. So Apache Airflow, Metaflow uh, from, I think it's from Netflix um, are a couple of them. Um, so, but it's, it's definitely important to be able to automate everything because that then allows you to, um, to be able to run things. Uh, one, it's much easier for you. If anything changes, you have new code you want to test. You basically just have one button to push and everything goes. One of the things that we've started doing is using our test framework to actually run analysis. So, you know, we, we've already built testing, right? To make sure that the code works, but it's also possible to basically just 
put your analyses into a test. So basically say, hey, I have, you know, I have all these 12 analyses I want to run. I'm going to write each of them as a test. And then basically I can just say, hey, PyTest this directory. And it goes and runs all of those analyses. You can see that in this, this is for our, our recent NARPS project. All the image analyses were, um, were defined as tests. So in this case, you know, it goes, runs them, takes about 16 minutes to do that. And it tells us, hey, all the tests pass, which means that none of the analyses crashed. Now, one of the benefits of this is that you can then automate this further using um, a tool from software engineering called continuous integration. So continuous integration is basically a system that reruns all the tests anytime anything changes in a code repository. So we use this for the DARP study um, where we, you know, we had a, a large code base um, and obviously we were doing continuous development on that. Each time we made a change to the code and pushed it to, uh, to GitHub, that we set that to trigger this system called CircleCI to basically grab the code, grab the Docker container that defined the platform, grab the data that were needed for running the analyses, those were on Zenodo, and basically run everything um, and tell us ultimately, did it succeed? And one of the things you can have it do is basically save all the results out as an artifact. And now you have your full analysis run, all the, the results saved out that you can basically just then hand over to somebody. Um, now, you know, when we were doing this, CircleCI was the, the kind of platform of choice, but now GitHub has its own continuous integration system called uh, GitHub Actions that is, is pretty easy to use and I would recommend that. Okay, so why, why aren't we there already? Why isn't everybody doing all this stuff, right? Well, there, it's all about incentives. Um, so first, like, you know, I've already shown you a bunch of books and a bunch of new tools and all this sort of stuff you have to learn. You know, who has time to learn all that extra stuff, right? Um, it's, you know, there, we have a, a limited amount of time and obviously learning this stuff is gonna take away from other stuff that you might do. Um, and this combines with the fact that you know, there's little incentive for this, for, for one to do this sort of stuff. This is what happens if you put it, the academic job market is into Google. Um, and so, you know, it's clear now that the, the incentives for people who are, you know, early career researchers are all about publishing more, right? Not publishing papers that are more reproducible, simply publishing more papers in fancier journals. And any time you spend trying to make your research more reproducible is almost certainly going to result in fewer papers per, per amount of time. So, you know, a number of us have gotten very interested in, you know, what we can do to, um, to try to basically align these incentives. And there's currently a project um, that I've been involved in a little bit uh, run by the National Academies called the Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science. They're soon going to be putting out a toolkit that's largely meant for sort of universities to, um, to, to, you know, kind of figure out how can we make it so that, you know, people are incentivized to do open and reproducible science. Um, and finally, I want to, you know, highlight an idea that has come about recently. You know, Uta Frith wrote about this recently in her, um, in Ticks, but it's actually an idea that's been around for at least a decade. John Horgan wrote about it, you know, back in 2011, this idea of slow science. So Uta Frith says, fast science is bad for scientists and bad for science. Slow science may actually help us make faster progress. Um, and John Horgan says, I've, expending, I've expended much of my career heaping calumny on bad science. Why am I so opposed to the slow science movement? Here's why. I fear that if scientists really slow down and start publishing only high quality data and theories and have been du double and triple checked, I won't have anything left to write about, right? Meaning that he won't have bad science to trash on. Uh, so just to summarize, I've tried to lay out, you know, a set of values, principles, and practices that I think together define how we can move towards not just, you know, sort of saying that reproducibility is important, but having it be, you know, central and fundamental to our, to our research culture um, in neuroscience and in data science more generally. So finally, I want to uh, thank my lab. This is, this is my lab circa uh, 2020. Um, the way that we've been seeing each other, and mentioned that we've just started a new center at Stanford as part of the Data Science Institute 
called the Center for Open and Reproducible Science or CORES, which is going to be um, developing infrastructure and, um, and tools to help people do open science. Um, so with that, I will stop and be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Russ. What a lot to think about in terms of, I don't know, just thinking of the, the picture in my head of this layer cake of code development, GitHub, data, workflows, um, you know, continuous integration, and all of this as being this infrastructure for reproducible science. Um, you made a point of talking about this is the, the sources of potential places where reproducibility is probably really important. And then it's in terms of the variations between computer systems, whether, you know, uh, big Indian, little Indian problems used to be the bane of our existence. Um, software errors, um, we've seen several of those crop up in particular in neuroimaging, for example, where uh, statements about probability of results happening was uh, improperly reported. Software libraries, they change all the time. You got to recompile stuff and, and all that. And uh, you mentioned about um, the portability of the, the methodologies, um, their provenance and best practice. I mean, how can we do a better job of making sure that all of those things, you touched on this in terms of peer-reviewed publication, what do the journals think of all this? Um, I know you're, as a journal editor yourself, um, this must come up. What, what do the journals think about this process that people need to go through? Um, I think it, it, it's an interesting question, right? And I think it varies across journals. Clearly, you know, some journals are, and I think data sharing has been the, you know, the probably the most prominent place where this has come up. And there's a number of uh, journals that are either requiring data sharing, like, um, you know, like plus one, or that are trying to incentivize it by, for example, giving badges, like, you know, the psychological science does. Um, and they, you know, you can also have badges for things like, you know, materials and code sharing. Um, I think that the challenge for the, and you know, nature, the nature journals have also done some various experiments, like, you know, having people upload things to code ocean. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, they're still sort of struggling with particularly how to manage re the review process around, uh, you know, stuff that's, you know, research objects beyond the paper, right? Cause historically yeah. we've just reviewed the paper. Um, but, um, but it, you know, it's clear to me having been, you know, for example, I, I reviewed one paper a few years ago um, where it was in a journal where they shared the data. And I, it was, you know, I looked closely at the data and I realized, hey, there's a problem with what you've done. The results are probably due to an artifact here rather than due to a real result. Um, and that paper, you know, may well have gotten published had they not shared the code and, and we, you've been able to see that. But that takes a lot of work on the reviewers part, right? Reviewers are already, it's already hard to find reviewers. Reviewers are already strapped for time. Um, and so expecting them to do this is challenging. Um, you know, some journals have like statistical editors who will actually look at the statistical stuff, but that doesn't mean that they're able to, to like go in and actually run the code. Obviously, if it's, if it's easily runnable, like if it's, you know, containerized or if it's in a, you know, in something like one of these sort of online platforms like Binder or something like that, or Code Ocean, then that makes it a lot easier for people to do. But, you know, it requires that the, the reviewers have expertise in this. So I think that's the big challenge. I think the, the, the journals, many of the journals, you know, are many of the top journals, at least, are very attuned to the issues. They just, I think, don't know how to deal with the challenges of actually getting people to review the code and the data. Yeah. What, you've mentioned a number of different resources um, that um, places where people can share code, um, how they can link it up. To, uh, for example, with the, the Circle CI thing, I wasn't familiar with, and that sounds really interesting. Um, but it seems like not a day goes by, at least from my perspective, there isn't some other new thing that I should be attending to for how I should share my data, my code, my results. And uh, how, how do you, it, it'll get that some of them are brand new and some of them have a big, huge community around them. For example, like the galaxy people just seem to like, that's just caught fire across the, the planet. How do you kind of filter these? How do you know when something is, something you're gonna go and tack your flag to in terms of resources for trying to make things reproducible. Yeah, I mean, I try not to be a super early adopter 
Um, yeah, me either. <laughs> and, I've been burned and before. In some ways, <laughs> like, you know, allow other people to kind of do the exploration and then I can exploit once they've found something. So, you know, what, what I try to do is like, look at what other, look at what the, like, you know, the early adopters in my particular field are doing. So for example, you know, we use NiPi, like, you know, Galaxy's taken off in a lot of areas. It hasn't really taken off in neuroimaging as far as I could tell. Um, and that's, you know, in large part because there are other, you know, um, there are other sort of tools like NiPipe that I think have become, you know, sort of more popular. Um, and to the degree that there's a domain specific tool or a field specific tool, I usually kind of, you know, tend towards those. Um, you know, I, so I, I think part of this is about like, you know, really keeping your ear to the ground uh, in terms of like what the, you know, like what the, the people at the bleeding edge are doing and then, you know, letting them kind of smooth things out a bit. So waiting, you know, if they're still like, if you hear them talking about, you know, Circle CI and then they're still talking about it six months later, then it's probably a good that sign. It's huh? a, <laughs> a good sign that it actually sort of hung around. Yeah. Cause I, you know, there are certain, there are certain early adopter people who I won't name. And I feel like every time I have a conversation with, with them, I have to learn like 12 new acronyms, yeah. right? Because there's all these new, new projects they're talking about. And, and I try to, I try to let them smooth that over for me. I, 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 I go through that same process myself. It's just trying, I just try to keep up. Um, now uh, you, you, I want to hear a little more about your kind of personal journey here of how you started to become an advocate for studying reproducibility um, in neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, how you established this in your laboratory and what advice you might have for young researchers who are just really getting started building laboratory. How do you establish and get this culture underway in their laboratories? Yeah. Um, so I got, you know, I, so, you know, I grew up as kind of an open source software advocate, I guess. And so, you know, even at the beginning of my career, I was, uh, you know, sharing code. I had a back around like 2000 or so we had this SPM ROI toolbox that you could use for like extracting data from SPM analyses that we shared openly. So I've always been an advocate for, for kind of, you know, code sharing and, and openness. Um, and I think that's just kind of a philosophical thing, you know, around how I think science should work. Um, the reproducibility stuff I became much more attuned to around 2008, there was a, um, a paper that when it was initially floated was titled Voodoo Correlations in Social Neuroscience. It ended yeah. up with a, a different name, but I saw the preprint and, you know, it highlighted this issue of, of a practice that people were doing in the neuroimaging literature it was basically double dipping. Um, with ROI analyses and, you know, realize that we had done that in some of our papers, um, even though we weren't named, you know, in that, in that, the, the paper by Ed Bull and colleagues. Um, and so started really trying to like, you know, dig in, dig more into the, the nature of our methods. Um, and then, you know, soon thereafter came about the, uh, the whole quote unquote reproducibility crisis that's kind of started in psychology. Um, and, and that, you know, highlighting issues around like, you know, questionable research practices, p hacking, that sort of stuff. And, and again, you know, got me realized that, you know, many of the things that they were showing to be problematic were things that pretty much every neuroimaging lab was doing. Um, and so that, you know, those things really got me to start rethinking how we do science. Um, and so and then when I moved to Stanford, I was lucky enough to have two things happen. One was Chris Gorgolewski uh, joined my lab as a postdoc. He's now moved on to Google. Um, but, you know, he and I kind of were able to build, we were able to get a, a large grant from the Arnold Foundation and build this, um, what we call the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, which was the, the, the home of the Open Neuro Project. We had started sharing data back around 2010 as part of this Open fMRI project. And then Open Neuro was kind of like the next generation of that. Um, and I, you know, obviously, Jack, your, your early work was really inspiring around, you know, data sharing. And, you know, when it, when it finally really sort of took off around 2010, you know, a lot of people were sharing resting data. We wanted to be in the business of sharing uh, task fMRI data in particular. Um, and so, you know, built some infrastructure around that. Um, and then, you know, more recently, I've been focusing on bids as, a, as an essential part of the infrastructure for data sharing. Um, so that's a, a long-winded way of kind of talking about, uh, you know, how I got here. 
how have I established a culture of code reproducibility in my lab? Um, one is, I think, you know, um, highlighting the highlighting the the need to be thoughtful and the need to kind of you know think about uh, how one writes code and having you know I think that you know it's easy to just kind of write code and assume that it works, right? If you don't see any problems, you assume that it works. And I try to, you know, more than anything, instill this sort of reflective philosophy about like, you know, the fact that I, I wrote a blog post a few years ago talking about the principle of assumed error. This idea that like, if you, if you have an analysis that quote unquote works, that you should basically <laughs> assume you've done something wrong and um, try to figure out what that might be. And, you know, we've had, we've had interesting cases in the lab where, you know, one of the postdocs had an, a result that looked really good, um, but had, for some reason, like had a suspicion that something funny might be going on. And it took this person at least a month of like digging around off and on to find the error that they had made in the code that when it was fixed, the result went away. And this, I mean, and this speaks to the kind of cost of reproducibility. I wrote a piece in Neuron last year called The Cost of Reproducibility, right? If you work that way, you're going to have fewer papers, period, right? This person probably could have published a perfectly good paper on this interesting result um, in a good journal um, that would have probably never been uncovered because people are so, you know, unlikely to actually try to replicate any particular findings, or like dig through code, even if the code was shared, it's unlikely anybody would have put, put in the work to find that problem. Um, this is a person who's, you know, career-wise false discovery rate is gonna be low, right? There, you, it's a person whose work you can trust, um, but unfortunately, you know, that, that kind of trust is not the thing that gets you jobs, right? Or gets you tenure. So, um, so people, you know, my trainees publish relatively little compared to other labs. Like I had two PhDs recently who both walked out with like one, you know, they had a, a few like smaller papers, but one kind of big paper. One was, one was a PNAS paper, one was a nature communications paper. So I think they were high impact papers, but they aren't published. They don't have these long CDs because they're not like cranking things out. If you kind of, you know, have a, a factory that cares less about republishing. Um, and that's a, to these people, I think that, um, you know, ultimately, you know, they've been able to go on and, and do good things in their careers. Um, but, um, but it, you know, it speaks to one of the, one of the questions is there like, you know, this, it, one can get dinged for not being productive. Now I should say, you know, I, I, there are people I know, um, in the field who have always published relatively little, um, but, when they publish something, it's really good. Um, and so I think it's, you know, there's, there's room for those type of people, but it's, it can be hard to, it can be hard to get the job as that sort of person. Once you have the job, it's, I think people can get tenured, you know, if they can show that, Hey, I publish one paper a year, but it's a really good paper rather than publishing, you know, five papers a year and having them all just kind of be, you know, sort of factory stuff. Um, but it's a, it, I think the only way to fix the, this issue is by, I think there's, there's, it has to happen from two directions. One is changing from the top, right? That university presidents and provosts, department chairs, you know, senior faculty all need to change the way they think about like how we judge people for hiring promotion and uh, tenure. Um, and at the same time, we need pressure from below where, you know, fields need to push to you know, push everybody in that uh, particular discipline to do open science in the way that I think, for example, the the you know OH the Human Brain Mapping Organization has. It's interesting that you know, I remember a, a relatively you know famous senior person a few years ago complaining at at an OHBM meeting that you know that the open science zealots had taken over the organization. Yeah. <laughs> Fast forward five years, and this person is now one of the biggest advocates for open science. So that you know that kind of change can happen pretty quickly when there's a lot of pressure from the bottom. Um, but I think we also need the pressure from the top. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, well, I think 
with that's a great uh, place to end. And uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Poldrak, for for sharing your your thoughts and uh, your your uh, ideas about reproducible science, about how to implement it, and uh, tools for so doing, and sharing us with your, your personal story and ideas about how to uh, implement this in in the laboratories of the young investigators who are joining us today. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you next week for our uh, next uh, installment in this uh, seminar series. So thank you everyone. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye all.